Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm Ian Bremer, president of Eurasia Group. I am not surprised that this room is completely packed, uh, despite the fact that there are no Russians attending. Everyone else at the forum is deeply interested in what they are up to, and we all, the panel, recognize a lot of you here. We have 45 minutes for a very lively conversation um, on what's next for Russia and the implications for the rest of the world. Uh, let me start by introducing uh, my esteemed panelists, Alex Stubb, uh, who is director of the School of Transnational Governance, the European University Institute, of course, also former prime minister of Finland. Um, Karen von Hippel, the director general of RUSI, um, and then Samir Saran, who is the president of the Observer Research Foundation, three serious global thinkers to talk about a very serious global issue. So let me start. Um, which is, if we want to talk about uh, the future of Russia, and we don't have any Russians here to discuss it with, I need to, I'm stuck with you, um, <laughs> on, on what you think the Russians think. I've heard so many people say that, well, we can't move to a negotiated settlement because the Ukrainians think they're going to win and the Russians think they're going to win. You can't, you never get uh, a ceasefire, a ceasefire when that happens. Do the Russians really think they're going to win at this point? Do you believe that? And if they don't, what are the implications of that for how Russia is likely to behave in the coming months? Let's make it easier. Let's not, let's not talk long term. Alex, start with you. I, I guess I'm the natural start because Finland gave Russia its independence in 1917. Absolutely. So in that sense, you're know, very close to it. Um, I don't know what the end game of this is going to be. I think in Georgia, the case was much easier. I mediated the ceasefire there with Bernard Kushner as foreign minister. It was five days uh, and two frozen conflicts. Uh, but this one is, is too difficult to define because Zelensky can't give up. We saw his speech uh, a little bit earlier, and it's much easier to defend your country and your identity than to attack. Uh, Russian military is actually quite weak, surprisingly weak. Uh, and it's very difficult to put, for Putin to define a victory. I think it has to be a territorial definition, so therefore for Putin it's only Donetsk, perhaps a little bit more, and Crimea, whereas for Zelensky he could never approve that. That's why I'm thinking we're in day 88 of the war. The Finnish winter war was 105 days. This is going to go way beyond that. Much longer. I don't have an answer for what, where this is going to end. Because there's no stable equilibrium in the near future from your perspective, Alex. Truly. Uh, there's no stable equilibrium whatsoever. Uh, the only thing that we can hope for, I guess, is regime change. But even in that case, I don't know that we'll get a softer uh, leader for Russia. And you know that in Russia, all leaders are supreme. They get their uh, prerogatives either from God or the class. So, Karen, thank you for opening. Um, <laughs> Do you think the Russians see an outcome that they can announce as a victory, both in Ukraine as well as what it means for their relationship more broadly with NATO? So thank you, Ian, and thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today, even though all of you are sitting in the dark. It's hard to see <laughs> who's in the room. Um, I guess I, first I would, I know this is an obvious point, but I would distinguish between Russians and Putin, because it's really Putin's war, and we don't want to vilify the Russian people. Um, even Russian soldiers who were getting killed, they didn't know what they were getting into uh, at the start. So I do think this is Putin's war. And what does Putin think? I don't think any of us know. Everyone's been trying to second guess what he thinks. Does he even watch Western television? I have no idea if he even knows what others are saying about him. And, and people who I ask who follow this very closely, they also don't know. And so it's hard to say, are people telling him the truth? Does he know what's going on? Um, and, uh, and what are his red lines? Uh, it's hard to say right now. You know, the, the d distinction between offensive and defensive weapons has evaporated. Those coming from the West, uh, we weren't sure if if we provided offensive weapons, that might be a red line. We just don't know yet with him. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's, there's too many unknowns out there. Does it worry you that things that were clearly red lines for a lot of countries in the West two months ago, literally over weeks, vanished? Whether it's the type of weapons that are provided or the real-time intelligence that's being provided or the level of sanctions going to be provided. I mean, literally on every yeah. one of those issues, things that a couple months ago, after the Russians had already invaded, right. and you said, no, that's too far, yeah. now they're not. What does that say well, to you? 
I think it actually says that the Russians are overwhelmed by what's happening. They might be red lines and they might have been red lines, but I'm not sure they're capable of responding in the way uh, that they would have done if they had if they had actually spent money on modernizing their military, right? They're in a very different place than everybody thought they would be. Samir, do you think red lines for the Russians have been crossed at this point? And what do you think the outcome is likely to be? No, I, I would agree with Karen. I think uh, even if they have been, I don't think there's too much uh, uh, coming by way of any fresh response. Uh, pretty much everything that was in the toolkit has been deployed. Uh, uh, other than, of course, uh, something that none of us would want. Uh, uh, and I think that's something that should worry us. Uh, at what point are you cornered enough to think about? Uh, I, I, let's be honest here. I, I think, uh, let, let me, uh, Ian, go back to your, your conversation with Alex. I, I think the difference, or, or with Karen, in fact, with Russia and Putin, I think you came out with two distinctions, Russia, Russians and Putin. I think one of the trends we need to watch as we look ahead is will that distance increase or will that now start converging? And if it starts converging, then we are in for a, a, a terrible decade in Europe. Uh, because we know a Russian society, which unites against some sense of um, assault, um, is resilient. And we could, in be, we could be in for a long haul. So I, I think that is a, a good trend to watch, uh, the, the distinction between Russians and Putin. And the second is the equilibrium you mentioned uh, uh, earlier, Ian. Uh, I don't think the two equilibriums that work are desirable for both. Uh, one is, of course, uh, uh, you know, a certain annexation of a certain territory, and we create a new line in the map, and um, everyone lives happily ever after. That's not going to happen now. So that equilibrium is not on the table, and is not certainly going to lead to peace. The, the second is a complete Russian retreat, um, uh, and and uh, you know, uh, it, it basically go back to uh, uh, the the pre um, Crimea times and literally uh, make peace and, and begin new, uh, that the Russians are not going to agree to. Uh, and I agree with Alex that even if you were to think about regime change, I fear that the next person who comes in will not come here to, to undo what Putin did, but to complete what Putin wants to do. And I think that is also a risk we should be considering as we think about it. So I think we are in for a, we are in for a tough period ahead. It's difficult to predict. Now, Karen, how much of a Russian retreat should the West want? I mean, in other words, I mean, you hear the NATO allies that are saying, oh, we could take them out of Crimea, potentially. I mean, you know, clearly the interest in all the territory that was taken post-February 24th, but what about that that was informally occupied? What about the attacks that are on Belgrade? What about the, the degradation of the Russian military? I mean, different Western leaders have said different things about what the desired outcome is. What do you think the West should be looking for? Well, the West, the West is saying it's up to the Ukrainians, obviously, to decide when they want to compromise and how. Uh, I think uh, uh, the Russians, uh, uh, they, they're pulling back to a degree, but, you know, as, as Samir is saying, it's just so hard to know what they can go back home and de describe as a victory. So, it, you know, if... Sorry, I've got cream in my eyes. Um, it's hard to it's hard to know. I'm sorry, I'm I'm distracted a bit. Ian, could you start over with a question? No, sure. Yeah. The, the question was, what do you think the Western interest oh, right, right. should be? Right, and and at the moment we're seeing divisions starting to appear, even amongst NATO allies. I think the French and the Germans want more of a compromise. The Americans, in particular, are now saying, uh, you know, that victory is possible. And NATO Secretary General has even said Ukraine could win this, whereas before... Yeah, and the Germans and the French privately are saying we should not right, be saying right. that the Ukrainians can win this, right? right? So right. I'm asking where do you come down on that and why? Yeah, I look, it, it really depends on how long this goes on for, because I think, you know, Russia could just go for broke. It's hard to see any of us living with Putin after this. I think we'll probably talk about this a bit later, but assuming that they win this somehow, I don't see how any Western country can shake his hand in the future. He's, he is already an international pariah. So there, in a sense, there's no going back to where we were with Putin. Some countries may, but, but many Western countries won't. And then what does that mean for him? Is he going to feel so much against the wall that he may do something really scary, which many of us are worrying about, something like a nuclear weapon or tactical nukes? Or 
will he just declare victory and try to rearm and prepare to go back again? But he, while he is alive, while he is a president of Russia, I don't think he's ever going to give up on this vision that Ukraine is part of Russia. Now, Alex, I, I, of course I have to go to Finland. You told me a couple of months ago that Finland was going to join NATO. You were a little mm. bit ahead of the country, but not by much. They clearly are moving in that direction very fast. Um, the Russians initially said, you know, there would be military consequences. There was some nuclear saber rattling. It feels, at least in the last few days, they've walked that back a little bit. Is that an accurate read? How do you see the Russian reaction to what is almost certainly, or certainly likely, to be an expansion of NATO to involve a very significant piece of the Russian border? Yeah. I mean, I guess we should go back. I mean, I've been an advocate of Finnish NATO membership for the part of 30, better part of 30 years very much in a minority, but things in Finland changed overnight on the 24th of February. We used to be 50% against, 20% in favor. Overnight it was the other way around. Now the latest opinion poll is roughly 80% in favor. So it's a bit North Korea in the time I was admitting the parliament voted 188 in favor and eight against. First so, time I've heard you compare yeah. those two countries. Yeah, I know. It's, you know, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. But so, so basically, you know, it was, it was a something driven by rational fear. And the whole idea was that Finnish security policy has been based on a combination of idealism and realism. Idealism in the sense that we wanted bona fide to cooperate with Russia. When you have 1,340 kilometers of border with Russia, you want them to be more like Sweden than, you know, like what they are, right? But then at the same time, we have one of the largest standing militaries uh, in Europe with 900 reserves, myself and Björk, Kure uh, Björklund included. Uh, we have 280,000 that we can mobilize in wartime. We have 62 F. Uh, 18s. We just bought uh, 64 uh, F-35s, and we didn't buy them because of Stockholm, right? So, so this was the sort of balance. Uh, now, the Russian reaction has actually been very moderate. I mean, when Putin and Lavrov say that Finnish and Swedish NATO membership is not a threat to Russian security, then you know that we're okay. Um, so, so it's been very moderate. We expect some cyber attacks, you know, a homepage is going down, perhaps the banking system attacked, uh, a lot of information stuff, but conventionally, no. But what's your theory for why they've backed down publicly well, the way they have? Well, two reasons. One is that they will see Finnish and Swedish NATO membership uh, as a Nordic model of the alliance. So that means that you've had Norway, Iceland, and Denmark as members since the foundation in 1949, and they haven't seen them as threats. So in that sense, they don't see our enlargement as an aggressive one. I think it was pretty cool, actually, that my president said when he was asked in a press conference with Boris Johnson that who should be blamed for this. Was he, he said, I think Putin should look himself in the mirror. That, you know, this is Putin's enlargement. Uh, and in that sense, it, it's not an aggressive one. And I, I think they'll be quite calm about it uh, in the future. The second reason is, I, you know, I think the Russian military, I'm, I'm not an expert, but it is struggling in Ukraine right now. And you can't multitask, you can't go onto two fronts. Uh, and they want to keep the eye on the ball in Ukraine at the moment, because this war is, as much as I'd like to say that, you know, mixing Putin, this is Putin's war, it's about his legacy. He wants to see himself next to the Russian greats, Stalin, Peter the Great. He wants to see a historic Russia with one language, one uh, religion, and one leader. He's not going to give up. This, so, so in that sense, he's focused on that, and that's why he doesn't have time that much for Finnish and, and uh, Swedish NATO membership. Looks like Turkey has more time for that at the moment. Samir, um, you heard Karen say that Russia is now an international pariah. Of course, Russia is not a global pariah. Russia is not a pariah for the world's democracies. And I'm not just talking about India. I'm talking about Brazil and South Africa and Mexico and a whole bunch of countries. Tell me how you look at the West saying Putin is a war criminal, they need to be cut off, no Russian attendees at the WEF, Wimbledon, the Olympics. I mean, you know, whether you're talking culture or uh, economics. Ice or, hockey world championships, that's the key. For here. example, <laughs> how, how do you relate to that? And not just from an Indian perspective. Actually, I don't relate to it. I think they've gone bonkers. That's my response when you, when you shut down a musical performance or a ballet performance or uh, prevent uh, folks from participating in sports events. I think a continent has gone mad. That's my re response. I, I don't relate to it at all. 
it's alien. I mean, it's like me uh, saying that uh, Americans are not permitted in India because they threw the Afghanis under the truck, right? Or they decided to invade Iraq and bomb them to the Stone Age. Uh, uh, you know, the fact is that terrible things happen and, and, and we must condone them, we must oppose them, we must resist them, we must do everything under our powers to prevent them from happening again. But this Manishian binary choices is, uh, is an old uh, European obsession and God bless you for it. But I'm not going to be part of your, bin uh, your binary decision making. Uh, Russians, uh, like um, Karen uh, rightly indicated, is, is more than Putin. Uh, and, and I think the test for uh, the, uh, the relationship that Russia has with the rest of the world, and I think that's your question, is, is, is going to be whether uh, the Russian proposition uh, post what's happened now is attractive and compelling and, and, and offers um, some benefits to the rest of the world. And I suspect, and, and this is now, uh, so uh, listen, I, I, I like the Europeans, I'm married to one, uh, so don't get me wrong. Uh, 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 but but uh, uh, I think the challenge for Russia is going to be that there will be very few takers for Russia generally. And, and that's what I was discussing with Alex, that it's not whether India needs to make a choice about Russia. If Russia does not get its act together at $5 trillion, Russia has no stake in the Indian future. They have counted themselves out. It's not, if we don't have to do anything, they're doing it themselves, it's a IKEA store. Mm -hmm. so, so for me, I think the question is that does Russia have anything to offer to the world? And Russia in its current state is struggling to uh, provide any sense of partnership, benefits and, and offerings. And how much has your view changed on that issue as a consequence of the invasion of Ukraine? Okay, now uh, on, on a side note, I'm not a military expert like Alex again. But if you were to look at Armenia and then Ukraine, we should really be rethinking our defense planning in many parts of the world. Uh, I think uh, that weaponry is not doing too well. That's, that's one takeaway. So India should not be having such a strong defense Like I said, I'm not a defense Russia. expert, but I, I suspect that many, many experts around the world would be watching these conflicts quite closely to think about their own mm. uh, armies and... And, and planning purposes for defense and security mm -hmm. uh, uh, apparatuses. But uh, uh, as a consequence of this, I think fundamentally uh, something has changed. L let, uh, l let me give you an example of the BRICS. Now, I, uh, there was a statement by, uh, by uh, our foreign minister a few days ago that I, that, that I read, which says that there are three out of the five countries who have never uh, violated sovereignty of anyone else uh, and, and territorial integrity. Now, that's something, that's something big coming from uh, 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 within a grouping conversation. So I think it is going to have consequences. The idea that it's not going to affect brand Russia going ahead is absolutely rubbish. Russia has been uh, impacted terribly. Don't, uh, uh, just because uh, people are not joining the performative chorus of Europe and condemning them and giving a screen to the man to come and make a speech doesn't mean that we like the Russians. Mm -hmm. I think there is a, there is a false uh, assumption here that just because you are not shouting it out loud means that you have anything, any affinity to the actions of Russia. I think there's a difference between the two. Mm -hmm. Russia has a, the Russian proposition has very few takers anywhere in the world, uh, but, but, but condemning them and, and, and sending them to uh, Saturn to uh, live there after, after. Alex wants to jump in, but can, I, can we at least say that buying a lot more oil from the Russians doesn't mean that you are that bothered by them? So, you know, uh, I was telling someone else in the morning, I ha in the maths class, first thing that we learned was four into zero is still zero. So even if I was to buy four times more oil than Russian, it's so negligible that uh, uh, Germany would chew that up in the afternoon like my foreign minister mentioned. So it doesn't really matter. Me buying oil from Russia is not a factor here other than selling a Financial Times uh, struggling newspaper somewhere. It doesn't really matter to me. Alex. Yeah, I guess, I guess the basic message here is, and, and this is what I think we in the West are, are misreading, I think we're looking at this crisis for understandable reasons from a very Eurocentric perspective. So, for instance, we took a lot of joy in seeing the UN vote, 141 uh, condemning Russia, 35 abstaining, and, and four uh, being in favor of Russia. But those 141 votes were actually quite soft. They were scrambled in basically last minute. Uh, and the 35 votes that abstained, they were over half of the world's population. So basically the rest of the world, Asia, India, Africa, which is often non-aligned, China, even Latin America are telling us a story. They're saying that, listen, this is your war. It's once again a European war. Yes, it's about your territorial integrity. We understand where you're coming from. But listen, it has ramifications on us, on inflation, on food prices, on energy prices, and therefore sort out your own mess. 
And in that sense, I don't want to draw too big of a conclusion from this, but there is this element of a 1989 moment in the sense that we believe then that this is the end of history, everyone is going to go to liberal democracy, social market economy and globalization, and that didn't really happen. Uh, and, and in that sense, the West needs to refigure that are we looking at a value-based world order, which we've been pushing either through war or otherwise, or are we looking at a rules-based world order? So I mean, when, one thing that I think that you two agree on, I, and maybe Karen as well, we just haven't gotten to you yet, um, is that Biden's statement of this is about democracies versus autocracies, you would say that was a mistake. Well, I'm not saying it's a mistake, because to be honest, I think this administration has done a great job. I'm an avid transatlanticist, and you know, I'm really <laughs> excited that Finland is going to the NATO, and thanks Joe Biden and the rest of it. But I think it's too simplistic to say that we're moving towards some kind of a new Cold War, with a liberal world order and an authoritarian world order. I think the alliances are going to be much more flexible than what we are used to. I also don't think that we're going towards an era, which is a lot of the talk here at the WEF, of deglobalization. I think we'll have more regionalization of globalization, but it's not going to go away. And that's why I saw one really interesting one. I, I don't remember which minister it was uh, who said that, yeah, all of you Westerners are talking about deglobalization. But if we look at it here in our part of the world, Asia, it's never been stronger. It's just that it's not an American or European globalization. I, I think these are kinds of things which feel uncomfortable for us, but we need to, we need to have a conversation about them. So I'm going to go to Samir, and then I'm going to ask Karen about China. But before I do, I just want to let the WEF know that I don't know what the time is. And so if someone can put a timer in. I have a Finnish know. watch called oh, Suunto, that's, that's a little product beautiful. placement here, yeah, a great sports watch, 1337. That's just so I know uh, when we need to go to questions, if you can show me. Because we are going to go to questions. I want you to stand up when I call on you say who you are, and I'll make sure that we get to a bunch of people. But please, Samir. So, uh, autocracies versus democracies is uh, uh, Americanism. It's the bumper sticker view of the world. And Americans love the bumper sticker. So that's a, a global politics explained in a bumper sticker. So let's uh, leave that aside. But I think the question here is that how long before uh, will the world start blaming the West for the inflations that they are experiencing at home, food security issues, um, energy crisis, economies uh, uh, tumbling down. And uh, when will uh, a larger chunk of the global uh, 141 countries who voted for going to change their mind? And they're going to start beginning to realize that, that the weaponization of the financial system, SWIFT, energy, food, uh, is not just a Russian action. It is also the response to the Russian action that is causing it. And I fear that may uh, be another factor uh, in the days ahead uh, as the world realigns itself around this particular event. So let me ask you, from your perspective, which of these geopolitical gaps is more structural and significant? The gap between Russia and the G7 or NATO, or the gap between the developed world and the developing world? The latter. Because? Uh, uh, you don't get us, and we don't get you. Uh, <laughs> I think, I think this, Russia this, and NATO don't get each other either, I mean, to be fair. So uh, I'm just... Listen, that's a European problem, in just, solve it. Uh, our problem is that globalization meant coming out of Europe, right? So uh, I think the, the, the gap, the, the symmetry, or the asymmetry in, in our understanding of, of many of um, the positions you have taken more recently as a, as a group, as a, as a continent, as a, as a bunch of nations, seems to uh, resonate less in many other parts of the world. And I think it could be a comms issue, and, and maybe we need to rework on how we communicate with each other, but it could also be that we are different. And that's why we have uh, different sovereignties and, and, and constitutions. I mean, if I was American, I would have taken the American constitution. We didn't, right? We built our own constitution. So we don't necessarily agree with how the world needs to be shaped. So I think there is a, a, a political realism that needs to also be injected into how we assess each other. We were meant to be uh, different people. That's why we chose our own ways of, of managing ourselves. We decided to engage in trade and, and, and be good to each other and communicate and travel, and we need to continue to strengthen that. But to somehow assume that because we signed on to the WTO, we all agree to how the world must 
uh, look like in the future. The homogeneity is not going to be there. It's going to elude us. So, Karen, you look like you want to get in on that. I, I just, I'll let you do yeah. that before I ask you about China. Go yeah, ahead. Just two quick points. I mean, it's interesting, Samir, you didn't mention, you didn't blame China for the pandemic in many ways. And that's sort of... I did. I wrote like six papers on it. Okay, no, but just now. But no, one, but no one retweeted it, so I stopped mentioning it. Okay, no, it's just that when okay. there's a lot of blame that can go around, right? And all over the world. I mean, it's not just... Uh, uh, and China should, hasn't taken any responsibility for potentially... Uh, turning an endemic into a pandemic, but, um, but um, I mean, epidemic, sorry. But, uh, you know, the, the, the... And the Indians are on record as generally not liking the Chinese at this well, point. The so quad is kind of based on so that, right? So we have that. The, re the West versus the rest, it's more, there's Russia and China, and I think China is sort of second-guessing some of its, you know, close embrace right now of Russia. Then there's the West, and then there's the former non-aligned movement in a way that is probably going to act in a similarly non-aligned way that it used to and not necessarily sign up for everything. And so what we may end up with, which is kind of an interesting uh, return to political science theory for those of you who studied David Matrani, is a form of yeah. functionalism where yeah. you, different countries and groupings come together for a common purpose and then that when that purpose is over, that, that it, 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 it ends. I mean, I don't think many people think that the UN can solve any of these problems anymore, right? So people talk about global governance. You know, the UN has not just failed in this particular case, but it has failed over the last few decades in so many ways. I am a former UN employee. I'm a, a fan of the UN, but I'm you know, deeply disappointed in the fact that it's not able to provide the global leadership that we need in a time like this. Even the Secretary General today has been doing an amazing job trying to get people out of Mariupol, but more of the time than not, he admires the problem rather than tries to lead and, and, and provide that kind of good offices. Alex, you want, you want to jump in? Yeah, I guess one of the problems is that the multilateral system, which was created in a bipolar Cold War with the Soviets and the Americans, were created sort of in the image of the victors of World War II. I mean, mm -hmm. you can pose the question that why is France, why is the UK sitting in, in the UN Security Council, right? I mean, you know, it, it, it's, you, you can pose the question legitimately now, 70 plus years later. And, and you know, if you, if you want to have a rules-based system, you need to have the bigger players have some kind of role as well. I know this is a little bit paradoxical and, and uh, you know, some people push back on this, but I think we need to start thinking about that a little bit. A couple of additional points. On China, you know, I don't think, you know, I met Xi Jinping a couple of times when he was vice president and I think I was foreign minister. I think he's, he doesn't, he wasn't very happy that this took place because he wanted to focus on domestic things, two things actually. Zero COVID policy, which is going to fail totally because you can't contain a virus. Uh, and then the party congress uh, in, in, in October, November. Now, does he want Putin to lose? No. But I think Russia will become, if I may, a bit of a vassal state to, to China. China is not going to, you know, a lot of people say it's going to pivot to Russia. No, it's not. It's going to oscillate between the two, the West and, and, and Russia, because it wants to avoid secondary sanctions. Uh, because the business stock in Europe is 800 billion per annum, whereas in, in Russia it's under 80 billion. What it will do is the normal Chinese thing. In other words, create path dependencies inside Russia. So when we go out because of sanctions and power vacuums emerge, boom, the Chinese will go in and do the investment. So that's why I'm saying there's a lot of interesting shifts going on in, in, in this whole package. And, and so, Karen, do you see the Chinese on balance as having more opportunities that come out of this crisis, or is it more, much more of a challenge for it? It's a great question. I actually think China could have an incredible opportunity. I think uh, President Xi is one of the only people that Putin listens to or is even afraid of. And if China were able to put pressure on uh, Putin to end this war somehow, not only would China emerge in the global leadership position that many think it, it has come to being now a superpower, playing a positive role, but it would also go a long way to repair its relationship with the United States. So it could be a fundamental shift if China can play that role. Now, at the moment, I don't see China interested in playing that role, and it hasn't indicated that it would, if anything, you watch Chinese media and they just repeat a lot of the Russia propaganda. So they're not there yet, but it doesn't mean they can't be there.
Now, I, I want to turn to the audience. Can you please raise your hands and I'll call on you. Um, no, last no. question from me, a uh, quick one before we go, uh, and I'll start there, which is um, President Zelensky, who I've not actually mentioned, mm -hmm. and I really should before yeah. we go to Q&A, right? Yeah. Um, he comes out of the last three months stronger, an international hero, vastly more support, more well-armed military. Yeah. Alex, do you think yeah. that Putin is remotely willing or capable to live with that reality? Or are we sort of destined for another Russian bite at the apple if they're capable of doing it at some point in the future? I, the answer is, is no, he's not capable to live with this because obviously not only in the West, but in general, we are still seeing a grand aggressor attacking a small aggressor. And then we see a villain in Putin and a hero in Zelensky. But may I just sort of lift a slight warning finger? And, and just sitting and listening to Zelensky's speech today uh, and looking at the general mood, not only here in Davos, but, but I think in, in the West, I think we're, we're approaching the moment of what I call war fatigue. Mm -hmm. uh, which means that we are into day 88 or 89 of the war and we lose a little bit of that, how would I say, intensity and emotion that we've had with it. I mean, a lot of us on Twitter, of course, we follow it every day, you know, and, and, and we try to sort out and try to understand. But this solidarity, outpour of solidarity and unity and actually effective decision-making that I've never seen coming out of the European Union or this sort of new transatlantic alliance or even, you know, Finland and Sweden going into NATO, this is going to start turning when summer comes in. And, and what happens is that instead of looking at the solidarity aspects of, you know, we feel for the Ukrainians, a lot of people are going to start looking at their own situation. And we are in a situation where we're going to see an economic downturn, which is going to be combined with inflation, which is going to mean stagflation, which is going to be higher energy prices, higher food prices. And on top of that, we have over 5.5 million refugees uh, in Europe now. So what I'm trying to say is that to keep up the public support here for the war, whether you're Zelensky or whoever, is going to be extremely difficult. And that's why we're starting to see a little bit of cracks in one, the European one Union. One word too. answer. Who gets fatigued faster, the Americans that are farther away and don't care as much, or the Europeans that have a lot more to sacrifice and lose? Probably Europeans. Question to you, sir. Hi, uh, Bill Browder. I'm the head of the Magnitsky Global Justice Campaign. <clears throat> this question for Samir. The... Um, <clears throat> One of the big, the, the huge elephant in the room is the um, Putin weaponizing the um, price of food um, by restricting the export of uh, grains from Ukraine. It's having an effect on, uh, as we as we just said, on food prices and <coughs> fatiguing people. <coughs> but it's particularly fatiguing the um, <coughs> uh, the developing countries of the world, the less well-off countries of the world, countries like India. Um, and, and countries like most of those countries that said this has nothing to do with us. And so I'm trying to reconcile, and you don't have to answer on behalf of the entire non-Western world, but since you're, you made the point, I'm trying to reconcile this attitude that um, this is a problem of the Western world, um, nothing to do with us, you guys fight it out yourself, we're going to abstain, um, with, with the fact that you're probably going to bear a bigger price and more political instability and potentially um, starvation for not getting involved. Samir, thank you both. Uh, no, I, so I think it's like, um, sorry, okay, can I reply or are you going to collect some? Uh, no, no, you go. Uh, no, so I think it's a bit like, um, it sounded a bit like uh, I've heard um, others tell me in this very room that you guys are going to burn because of climate change. Why don't you mm -hmm. stop burning coal? It sounded a bit like that. Uh, that, you know, somehow uh, a European conflict becomes uh, my burden to bear. Now, of course, we understand that. We understand the conflict causes hardships. And I, I did mention that the, the question that uh, the politics uh, is going to respond to is that who does the, uh, the non-Western world blame for that hardship? 
that's the point I was trying to raise. I'm not. I'm not going into the physics. And you of, said it's a comms question, yeah. kind of. Yeah. And I said, I, I said it may the be point. A I was question. not trying to at all uh, uh, obviate uh, the very importance of what you've just asked me, Bill. Oh. My question is, who do you blame for it? I think if we were to do a poll today, you might get a certain answer. In three months, it might be very different. And that's the point I'm trying to make. That are we going to start seeing the weaponization of everything that has been uh, that has happened in this particular conflict, from the SWIFT system to uh, taking away people's reserves to bank but, accounts? You know, we've seen a weaponization yeah. of everything. Every, in, in fact, when I, l l sorry, I'm going to take 30 seconds because it's important. When we were designing the Raisina dialogue last month, and I went to a very senior finance ministry official and asked them that uh, what should we be discussing about uh, the pandemic response, recovery, in economy? No. We should be talking about the weaponization of supply chains, the weaponization of the financial supply chains. Uh, you know, everything that we were told was uh, was uh, a given is no longer true. Mm -hmm. And and many countries in the world are worried, and they depend on dollars, and when they depend on certain kind of Western institutions for for their survival. So yes, uh, the food is a very important question, and uh, we are all going to have to find a way to manage it. So what I'm hearing is that you know you just don't like big power unilateralism. Correct. Yeah. yeah, which is but manifest can, in different ways. Please, yeah, can I, if, if, can, but because it's a b business audience here as well. I mean, the way in which I want to think about things is that we've now had this sort of 30-year age of relative peace, right? But we think in geopolitics in old terms. We think it's sort of military and tanks and arms and things like that. But if we live in this world of or age of unpeace, I think Mark Leonard's called it, mm. where everything can be weaponized, that's when business comes in. Because the things that were supposed to bring us together, right? Trade, information, technology, the internet. They're actually tearing us apart at the moment and, and in a very effective way. So because you can use sanctions as a weapon, you can certainly use currency as a weapon, you can use energy as a weapon, you can use human beings in terms of migratory flows uh, as a weapon, you can use information as a weapon. And then we get into this sort of Hobbesian world a little bit where you know, you can really play the power game beyond. And that's why I keep on saying that all of these people who are trying to create some kind of a construct of a new world order where you have these poles and superpowers, I don't believe in that. We live in a transnational world which is actually quite messy. And I'm quite comfortable with that, actually. You know, I don't, I don't want to be dominated by anyone. But that's the reality that, that I think we, we live in. Politics is getting less and less important and actually business is getting more and more important Can in I just, its own way. I'm gonna push back on politics being less and less important, but not today, not right now, I just, won't. Karen, go ahead, jump in, but then briefly, the questions have to be quick because I wanna get two or three of them. Yeah, just again, br yeah. briefly on the, on the business point, I mean, don't forget, a lot of big businesses are voluntarily pulling out of Russia too, right? So they're playing that exact same card too. Yeah. Yeah, so is, was, we've never seen it at that level it, before. It was famously said that the most powerful generals America had in the 20th century were General Ford, General Motors, General Atomics, General Electric. <laughs> and now you have the four big tech companies uh, cancel a whole continent or, or a whole country. Mm. Now, that should worry a lot of countries around the world. Mm. That, that uh, based on a political decision by a set of actors, you have canceled uh, the communication capabilities of, of, uh, of a country. I, I would be worried if I was the communication minister in my country. So in another panel, we're going to ask Samir if American <laughs> government or American corporations are the larger evil, but not right now. <laughs> we have a question right here, please. Hi, I'm Jay Galla. I'm uh, chairman of the Amaraja Group in India, also a member of the Indian Parliament. We've been listening to all of you talk about the impact on the uh, expansion of NATO that this crisis has brought about, but nobody's speaking about non-proliferation and what's going to be the impact on non-proliferation because of this crisis. I'm sure the Ukrainians are regretting the day that they gave up their necks. <laughs> Who wants to take that? Karen? I mean, we've already seen a number of other countries uh, in, in East Asia, Japan and Korea, talking about getting nuclear weapons, uh, a lot of nuclear energy is being, uh, uh, the, lots of conversations about reinvesting in nuclear energy. So yeah, if, if you're an anti-nuclear energy or a nuclear weapons person, certainly uh, this isn't a good sign and certainly a good lesson. Just like Libya did the same thing, they gave up their nuclear weapons and then that was the end of it. So yeah. I'm gonna try to get to two. John, you're first. Uh, two points, Putin uh, is- John Shipman, ISS. John Shipman, double double S. Yeah. My view, Putin is um, hypersensitive to perceived provocation, but also hyper-responsive to perceived license. And the mistake that many in the West made in the first 30 or 40 days in the war is that we said what we would not do. Uh, 
and left too ambiguous what we could and, and would do. We lost all of our NATO muscle memory of flexible uh, response, intra-war deterrence, uh, strategic ambiguity, and gave him too much license. I would test Samir's second proposition. His second proposition uh, was that Russia would not uh, accept uh, the requirement for a full withdrawal. If the Ukrainians are willing to fight for it and we're able to enable it, that's a proposition that should be tested. If we cannot assure a free and open Black Sea, how can we talk in Europe and in North America about a free and open Indo-Pacific? My argument would be that the Western Indo-Pacific tilt is dependent on some success mm. in maintaining the European security order. On communication and messages, I would say to the Chinese and to Asians, the European security order is a core interest of the West. We only invite you to respect that. I kind of want Samir to answer that because I think it'll be interesting. No, no, I like uh, that Europe has core interests. I like that. Uh, but uh, their behavior in the last 10 years hasn't re reflected that. And uh, uh, we, were told, we were told that you're empire of, the, empire of norms. I think that was a term that was used for, for EU, not empire, not empire that would have military and security interests. But I'm glad there is a mi military and, and security muscle emerging. And I hope, and by the way, we will be cheering for you if your core interests are protected, uh, especially against uh, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, insidious and sometimes creeping onslaught from the Chinese. And, and that is the test. Bullying a $1.5 trillion economy with sanctions is not bravery. But taking on a $15 trillion economy and bringing them to keel, it would be defending core interests. And I don't think I'm seeing that sitting in issue. Alex, jump in. Yeah, just quickly on, on Europe used to be called a regulatory superpower. But I actually think mm. it's become an actor in the past 10 to 12 years, whether you like it or not. Because if we live in this new world of geopolitics, actually a lot of the instruments that the European has competition policy on big tech or trade sanctions, for instance, they are the exclusive competence of the European Union. I think the European Union was an actor in the euro crisis. You might have liked it or not. Correct. It was an actor in the, in the migration crisis. It certainly was an actor in COVID. Uh, and now it's an actor in the war in Ukraine, which is kind of interesting because we always belittle what the European Union does. So you should look at it, as like Samir said, as both an actor and a regulator. It's never going to be you know, uh, a big state or anything like that. But it certainly has a role which is different from what it used to be. A good argument for why politics matters more, as we just <laughs> suggested. Yes, please. Corporal yeah. Zadlo from Holland. Uh, what is true about the serious rumors that Mr. Putin is seriously ill? And uh, what will be the immediately consequence, what the forum thinks about when he will happily, uh, will hopeful peacefully pass away. <laughs> Hopefully he doesn't take too long that well, he hurts his health too much. Uh, what is the immediate consequence you expect from this fact? Well, Alex, you're geographically closest to him, so clearly you yeah, have the most insight. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can see you no, from I your mean, house. First observation <laughs> is I, I never liked this sort of psychoanalysis that a lot of Western media was doing about you know, the state of the mind of Putin and the size of his tables and COVID isolation. I think it's a rather irrelevant, uh, you know, but I met him quite a few times and I think, and Bill probably as well, I mean, he's, he's very intelligent, he's well prepared, he's shrewd, he's cold, he's calculative. Now we're getting into sort of this physical analysis of, of you know, is he eating cortisone and, you know, what's the... It, it's not the point. You have to understand that in Russia, ever since the 1600s, there has been a stable, strong leader with the Romanovs that came in after the age of unrest. There's only been one period where the leader hasn't reigned supreme, and that was Yeltsin uh, from 1991 to 2000. Everyone else, there's a clear hierarchy and a full dependency on both the oligarch side and the governance side and the princes. So there can always be a rather easy transition to a new leader within the Russian system, but it's always exactly the same. So in that sense, it's almost irrelevant whether Putin is leading uh, the show or not. What happened in 1991, after the uh, sort of pushing away of Gorbachev, there was a junta that came in, which was much more hardcore until then Yeltsin stood up on the tank. We just simply don't know, but I think in the West we need to stop this, you know, medical analysis of Putin. It doesn't get us anywhere, whether it's psychological or physical. Can I, I just, I sure. think your, the second part of your question is very important. 
you know, what does the world look like after Putin is gone and what should we all be doing, whether, you know, planning in the boardrooms or planning in governments to try to mitigate the negative impact if we do end up with another like-minded or a Navalny type. We just don't know. But certainly there are things we can be thinking about now and it's important to be thinking about that now. I don't think we're talking about it enough. Samir, go ahead. Uh, you know, I, I think I just want to pick up on Alex's point and something that you mentioned again. Listen, I think we all have to realize, and especially uh, those who believe in largely free, open societies and, and fair business arrangements, uh, that um, uh, the EU, the Indo-Pacific, the US interests, Indian interests are not uh, independent of each other. And in some sense, I think the big project we all now to, we all need to look forward towards is making the multilateral world, multilateralism, work with the multipolar world. Yeah. I think, uh, uh, like Alex mentioned, it was shaped by two big powers. Uh, and the winner, or the winners, shaped uh, many of the ethics uh, uh, to their uh, preferences. Uh, we are in a very different world. And I think uh, the multilateralism is not fit for purpose anymore. Mm -hmm. It's not serving any of us. Um, and uh, by the way, uh, uh, on uh, uh, John's point, I think he's, you're absolutely right. I think the Indo-Pacific and European security are uh, linked, mm -hmm. uh, you know, are joined at the hips in some sense. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it is impossible for the continental play to uh, not be shaped in a certain way unless Europe stands up. And, and Europe is standing up. And, and, and like I said, I applaud that. Uh, many of us are, uh, are going to be cheering for a strong European security presence in, in many of the debates of the future. Uh, perhaps it could moderate some of the idiosyncrasies of the US, by the way, who also needs to, uh, who's beginning to also realign many of their uh, recent um, positions. So I think uh, we need to work together and, 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 and I'm hopeful that we'll do that. I promised you lively, informative, <laughs> and on time. Would you please join me in thanking.